Hi, and welcome to the lecture for Module 9, where we'll be talking about the Renaissance in Northern Europe. We're dealing with quite a few different countries today and covering about two, two full centuries. So there's a lot of material that we'll be looking at today. And some of the things that we'll be focusing on are the differences in Northern Europe compared to Italy. So for example, in Northern Renaissance art, there's less of an emphasis on classicism and classicizing themes. Although they do show an interest in naturalism, they're not really specifically looking back to ancient Rome as a prototype. The other thing we'll talk about is the rise of oil as a medium for painting. Now we're used to hearing about works being oil on canvas, but that wasn't always so. In the north, this becomes a more popular medium to use oil paint rather than tempera, and even more than fresco as well. And finally, one of the major issues we'll talk about in the second half of the lecture is the Protestant Reformation, which begins in about 1517, and what that meant for the art world, because we've looked at a lot of religious art, and the Protestant Reformation has a serious impact on subjects for art and the approach of artists as well. So a lot to cover today. As I said, we'll be focusing on Northern Europe. We'll be looking at monuments that were produced in the area called Flanders, which is now modern day Belgium and even part of France. We'll also be looking at works from what we now call Holland or the Netherlands, in addition to some works produced in England. And we'll talk about some artists who traveled pretty significantly, but this is the area that we'll be considering today. So for the Northern Renaissance, we want to think about a span starting in about 1380 to the late 16th century, which goes to about 1580, so 200 years. And it encompasses several regions north of Spain and Italy. There's some similarities to Italy in that the political factors tied into the artistic developments that occurred during this period. So, for example, there's a Hundred Years War going on between France and England. We also see the rise of courts as major political centers and sources of patronage, just like we saw in Italy. You also have a lot of plague and religious turmoil that affects artistic production. And we also see an increase in greater sophistication of markets and trade, and this absolutely affects the art world. In the early 15th century, just like in Italy, we begin to see the emergence of naturalism, especially within the courts of Bohemia, Paris, and Burgundy. There's also a developing sense of artistic autonomy and self-awareness. They do lack this interest in humanism and antiquity, although in the north they do have communication with Italy. And again, we do, I've already mentioned this, but there's different media developing, um, specifically oil painting rather than fresco or tempera. We also see a number of manuscript illuminations, although we won't be talking about that. And again, we're focusing on painting today, but there are lots of examples of wood and stone sculpture. And there's also the very important rise of the printing press and print technology, not just for words, but also for images. So before we get started with our first image of the day, I want to talk about this technique of oil painting because I keep emphasizing that. With oil painting, you have pigments that are ground up, just like with tempera or fresco. And then they are mixed with an oil suspension, usually made out of walnut oil or linseed oil. It's not prevalent in Italy before the year 1500 or so, where tempera remains very popular. In the north, oil was popular from the early 1400s. Oil paint has a lot of advantages. It can be applied more thickly than tempera. Remember, with tempera, you had to use little tiny brushes and it dried almost immediately. And oil can be applied more slowly than tempera or fresco. Remember, with fresco, you've got that rush to get the full day's work done. Oil paint dries very slowly, which means it can be reworked pretty easily. And there's more possibilities of mixing and blending colors because it will actually blend, whereas tempera dries so quickly it won't really blend with anything else. This allows for a wider color range than what we've seen before. You also see the rise of the use of canvas as a support because it goes very well with oil. Tempera is a bit too brittle for canvas because canvases are flexible, whereas a wood panel is not. And wood panels are rather slick for oil paint, although we will see a lot of oil on wood images. So let's start with this image. I'm showing you Robert Kempen's Marode altarpiece, named after some of the former owners. This was produced in the city of Tournai in Flanders, and it dates to about 1425 to 1430. This is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so quite reachable for those who live in Philadelphia. Robert Campin was head of the Painters Guild in Tournai and who was very involved in civic life. This object is rather small in size and was used for personal or private devotion. 
And this was an important source of patronage for artists. So not all artists could create huge altarpieces that would be seen in the churches of the city, but often they needed to create these smaller objects for individual patrons. So what we're seeing here, the central panel is a scene of the Annunciation, where the angel Gabriel comes and announces to the Virgin Mary that she will become pregnant miraculously. Um, and you can see, it's hard to see here, but this little tiny detail of a little Christ baby who's just flown in through the window carrying a cross, and he flies in through the window without breaking the glass, which is a lot of people use to explain how a virgin conception could take place. On the right side, we see Joseph in his carpenter studio. On the left side, you see these two kneeling figures who seem to be looking into the room, and we can identify those as the patrons of the altarpiece. A lot of times when people would pay for art to be commissioned, they wanted their own portrait in it. Think about Enrico Scrivani is the same thing. So here we see this crowded domestic interior for the holy scene, but everything is very carefully rendered. Another thing that we'll talk about with the North is this interest in surface texture and detail. We really want to make fabrics and any other objects within it look as real as possible. They're less in interested in naturalism of the human form than in the objects that you see. So focusing just for a minute on the central panel, this Annunciation scene, you see a lot of different iconographic details and iconography are symbols interspersed within the painting. So for example, you see this vase with lilies, which were a common symbol of the Virgin's purity. Instead of a dove flying in, like you often see in Annunciations, you have this little tiny Christ, like I mentioned before, you can now see a little bit better the rays of light it comes in on. On the table, you also have this snuffed out candle and the ruffled pages of this book, signifying to us the recent arrival of both the angel and this little figure here. So we know that the atmosphere of the room has just changed pretty considerably. It's a very interesting perspective system. Now, the northerners aren't as interested in recreating a three-dimensional realistic interior. So, for example, we see the angel and Mary pretty well straight on, but notice how tipped up this tabletop is so that we can see the entire surface of it a bit better. And notice that the architecture of the room recedes very, very quickly, but it's not really following a single point perspectival system like we see in Italy, which we'll talk about even more in the next module. You have this very big and bulky virgin and angel. Mary seems unaware as, Gra as Gabriel moves in. She's diligently reading the Bible or some other devotional reading. Notice the drapery. You can kind of get a sense of the body under the clothing, but it seems like Kim Penn is far more interested in exploring the interesting patterns that can develop from all these different folds. It's not really very naturalistic. This isn't what the drapery would look like necessarily, but he's interested in this pattern rather than reflecting the body beneath the clothing. Just to talk for a minute about the two exterior panels on the left side, we see Joseph in this very crowded carpenter's workshop. Often it's said that he's building a mouse trap, which was a symbol for catching the devil, but that's been disputed by art historians. We don't really know exactly what's going on. We have the same idea with the perspectival look at the table where it's tilted up a bit, even though Joseph is seen from fairly straight on. We see all the tools of his trade here. And in the background, you get this really nice realistic depiction of this Flemish town in the background. Everything is very carefully rendered. Uh, there's this interest in his drapery, in the beautiful folds of this turban, in the careful rendering of the tools and the town behind. It's not often that Joseph is seen in a scene of the Annunciation, but he's very separated from the central panel, just like the figures on the left side here. We have these two donors, the ones who pay for the altarpiece, who are kneeling in the street. But it's a little bit confusing about how they are seeing what's happening. It's not very clear if this door is wide open so that they're peering right into the room of the Virgin Mary, or maybe it's just barely ajar. Maybe they can't even see into the room at all. The exterior views, as you can see, what I'm showing you in this image, they don't really make sense together. They don't continue the backdrop. You could kind of get a sense of the city back here, but there's no continuation of this large city wall here. So the inclusion of the donor portraits help us to know how the viewer is supposed to act. This is how we are supposed to approach this painting as well. Now we'd like to turn to another painter from the Flemish area. His name is Jan van Eyck. We'll look at a couple of images of his. 
He was very interested in naturalism, probably even more so than someone like Campan, even though we'll see some strange perspectival system in his works. He had a lot of significant patrons, including in the court and the merchant class. For example, he worked for the Duke of Burgundy for a while, uh, as well as private patrons like we're seeing in this painting. His naturalism is very meticulous. It's almost microscopic in the detailing that he renders. It's empirically based, so from experience rather than mathematically oriented and organized. So what that means is this direct observation from life. The oil technique gives artists the ability to refine and develop this method of painting. Vasari, who I talked about with the last module in the last module, said that Jan van Eyck was the first to discover oil technique. We know that that isn't true, but for a long time he was considered the proponent, the major proponent of the oil medium, and so that's another reason that he is so famous to us today. He developed luminosity in his work by using very thin glazes of paint, of oil paint, and glazes mean thin transparent layers to develop form, light, and color. So oil you could build up, it's not opaque like tempera was. He was also a master of using disguised symbolism. He was able to create a world that is at once vividly real and layered in symbolic meaning. He's the most famous artist in the North, both for the people living in the North, but also for Italians. The painting I'm showing you here is typically referred to as the Arnolfini double portrait, although the identification of the figures has been disputed. This dates to 1434. So we're going to talk about this assuming that we are looking at the Arnolfini in this painting. So Giovanni Arnolfini was a businessman, an Italian businessman from the city of Lucca, and it's thought that represented with him is his future wife named Giovanna Cenami. And Giovanni Arnolfini had, had established his business in the city of Bruges, which was in Flanders, which is in modern day Belgium. It's not really clear what's going on here, and it's often been stated that this is probably a scene of their wedding, but we can't really know that for sure. I want to talk for a minute about the iconography in this painting, so the various symbols, because there are so many. This is one of the most intensely scrutinized paintings probably in the history of the Renaissance because of all of this symbolism. So with iconography, it all relies on context. So once a symbol in Bruges is not going to be the same symbol if you go to the Americas or to Asia. Everything is relevant to its own context. So we can read each symbol in a number of ways. So first I want to talk about this fruit that you see over on the windowsill and on the dresser. They're, they're typically read as apples, which can be a, a symbol of fertility, or maybe it's supposed to make the viewer think back to Adam and Eve or the first marriage. This supports the idea that the painting has something to do with a marriage between the two figures. Also notice her belly. See how round it looks? Well, perhaps she's pregnant, but what's more likely is that she's actually pulling up her dress to seem that way. It's a very fashionable dress, and hiking up the gown makes it seem like she's pregnant, which is the goal of marriage. So that's another thing that relates it to marriage. Just above their joined hands, which seems a sort of symbolic gesture in its own right, there's this little tiny figure of St. Margaret. And St. Margaret was the patron saint of women in childbirth. So again, you've got this emphasis on having children. Down at the bottom, you see this dog. One of the most famous dog names of the past was Fido, which is Latin for faith or fidelity. So dogs are often representing that. Also, this is a very rare breed of dog and could be indicative of wealth. But there's also the idea that dogs are related to the idea of carnality. And so it could be a sort of sexual symbol, which again leads to childbirth. Notice also in the chandelier, which if Arnolfini is not careful, he's going to bump right into with this hat. You have a single lit candle here. It may be a symbol of Christ's presence or a sign of a legal event taking place. In the background, there's this interesting convex mirror where we see the whole scene reflected, and I'll show you a detail of that in just a minute. It could represent the all-seeing eye of God, and in the roundels, which are in the frame, all these little circles, here you go, here's a detail of it, all of the roundels are scenes of Christ's passion. So again, it's got this religious undertone to it. Notice here, while we're looking at this detail, you see the backs of Giovanni Arnolfini and Giovanna Cinami. In the background, you can see that there's two other people present. Who they are exactly, we're not sure, but one clue about who they might be 
is above the mirror we have the signature and this translates to Johannes van Eyck was here and it gives us the date as well right here so maybe one of the figures is supposed to be the artist himself but who's the other one it's really not clear it's interesting that the signature says that Jan van Eyck was here because normally a signature would read something like Jan van Eyck made this. So does this prove that he was a witness to a legal procedure? Is the painting commemorating a marriage contract? What's very interesting is that they don't actually get married until 13 years after the production of this painting. It does seem this very formalized setting. Notice how differently they're dressed. He's in the wealthy garb of a merchant. And just like Federico de Montefeltro and Battista Sforza, we have them divided based on the background. He is towards the window, the outside world. She towards the bed, this idea of domesticity. Notice they're both taking, they've both taken off their shoes. We see both pairs of shoes here. And that's another symbol that it may be a holy event taking place. As does his raised gesture, it almost seems like a blessing. So there's lots to say about this painting and lots of various interpretation possible. Whatever it is, it has really intrigued art historians and viewers for centuries. I also want to talk about this painting by Jan van Eyck, generally referred to as Man in a Red Turban. Titles in the Renaissance are all arbitrary. The artists never name them themselves. It's how we describe them. And this dates to 1433. It's typically thought that this is probably a self-portrait of van Eyck. Here we can see this incredible naturalism. You can see the moisture in his eyes and the reflection of light on his irises. The two portraits I've shown you show this rise in secular art that we see especially in the North. There's absolutely no religious meaning or content here. There's this focus on this single individual wearing this black robe with a fur-lined collar and this beautiful red turban. And just like with Campan, we see this interest in the folds and patterning of the drapery. It's in its original frame. The inscription on the frame says, Als ich kann Johannes van Eyck mi fecket, which means as I can at the top, and then below, Johannes van Eyck made me. And again, we have a date included here of 1433. It's meant to express a certain modesty in this inscription, as I can, the best I can do, but also to record his creation for whoever his patron was. Artists at this point in time almost never made things for themselves. Now, a self-portrait, it can be argued that perhaps he made this for himself rather than for a patron. But again, we don't even know for sure that it is a self-portrait. Notice the letters that he uses are rather Greek looking. And here we have the use of a sort of classical expression showing his interest in and knowledge of antiquity. Jan van Eyck was often compared to the Greek painter Apelles who was the court painter to Alexander the Great, a very famous painter that came out of ancient Greece, although none of his works survive. But this is a common association that is made with court painters. And remember, as I said, he worked for the Duke of Burgundy for a while, so he was a court painter himself. So I'd like to move on to another religious work. This is called the Portinari Altarpiece, and it's by the painter Hugo van der Goes and dates to the 1470s. Now, this is a work by a northern artist, but again, just like with the Arnolfini portrait, we have an Italian patron. It was commissioned by a man named Tommaso Portinari, and he was another Italian businessman who was living in Bruges. He actually managed the Medici Bank in the city of Bruges. The side panels depict the patron. So here we see Tommaso Portinari and two of his children, his two sons, who are being presented to the central scenes, the figures in the central scenes by their patron saint. So this is St. Thomas because Tommaso Portinari. On the right side, we see his wife kneeling here. Her name was Maria Baroncelli. And then we see their, their daughter depicted behind her. And again, with the same thing, we have patron saints who are standing in for them. So we have one of the Marys. This looks to me like Mary Magdalene right here with her ointment jar. They all kneel in this reverence of the Holy Family, which is depicted in the central panel. Notice that we're missing a patron saint on this side because the youngest son that we see here was added after the fact, so they didn't have room to add a third patron saint here. 
They all kneel in devotion to the central image, which is a scene of the nativity. You see the Virgin Mary in the very center wearing this beautiful blue dress. Again, notice the interest in the patterning here. You see Joseph in the background. You see the ox and the donkey in the stable. And the Christ child is laying here on the ground. They're surrounded by flying angels above, two kneeling angels here, even more angels kneeling in the front. And in the background on the right side, we have the shepherds. So this is also referred to as an adoration of the shepherds. In 1483, this triptych, so we've talked about diptychs before, but this is a triptych, just like the Marode altarpiece with three panels. In 1483, it was moved to a chapel in Florence, Italy, where it became very influential to Italian artists. Though we discuss the Northern and Southern Renaissances as separate entities, it's helpful to recognize that European borders and cultures during this time were increasingly more porous. That is, more people were traveling back and forth and they had more communication with each other. Like most Northern Renaissance artists, van der Goes is intently focused on detail, so he's relying on observation of nature to inform his technique. It seems that surface detail is more important than anything else. This leads to figures that appear a bit more stiff than his Italian counterparts. But we do see some interest in some Italian perspectival techniques, including atmospheric perspective. And that is, what atmospheric perspective means is as things recede into the background, they become a bit hazier and a bit more blue. And this is exactly how vision works. So notice how blue the hills appear against the horizon line. That's because that's how your eyes work. Next time you're looking at a nice landscape. Notice how as things recede, they sort of become more blue and gray. So let's talk about the central panel in a little bit more depth here. Notice that we have a bit of hieratic scale going on. See the Virgin Mary kneeling here and Joseph. They're both a little bit bigger than everybody else. Even the shepherds who are fully grown men, they're much larger than the angels. All of the angels appear dressed almost as priests or other religious attendants notice their beautiful robes and garments. And here again, this emphasis on the patterning and recreating this beautiful surface detail in the textures that would be presented by these robes. We also see with the shepherds this very naturalistic depiction. They are supposed to represent these common men of different ages, and they respond with a variety of expressions to the Christ child from pious prayer with this central here to awe with this figure who's, who's pulling his hands apart. And then finally, this shepherd in the background's got a sense of curiosity here. Van der Goes also uses iconography like we saw with Jan van Eyck. We see these flowers here, again, representing the idea of purity. Notice here that this frontmost jar, which is cut off a little bit in the, in the detailed image. Here, I'll go back to it though. This is a glass jar which represents the ability of the Holy Spirit to impregnate Mary without destroying her virginity, this idea that light passes through glass without damaging it. The grapes on the ceramic jar here represent the wine of the Eucharist. The red lilies refer to the blood of Christ. The three irises refer to the Trinity. The white ones indicate purity. The purple is for Christ's royal ancestry. There's even more present here, but I figure that's enough for your iconographic purposes. So I talk about how porous the borders are and how these are moving from place to place. This came to Florence in 1483. We actually see it influencing Italian artists. Here I'm showing you a similar scene, this adoration of the shepherds by an Italian painter named Domenico Ghirlandaio, who is actually the teacher of Michelangelo. Look how similar these shepherds look to the ones in the Portinari altarpiece. They're sort of rustic figures, and they look quite a bit like that in the Hugo van der Goes painting. But notice Ghirlandaio's strong emphasis on antiquity. We've got this procession through a triumphal arch, classicizing elements, a classical sarcophagus here. And there's less patterning of the drapery and less interest in surface detail. So this is a nice comparison just to give you a sense of how different painting is at similar times. So now we're going to move into the 16th century. And just to give you an overview of what's going on before we talk about this work of art in some detail, there's a lot of political shifts going on during the 16th century north of Italy. Flanders and the Netherlands are ruled by Spain after the Duchy of Burgundy is broken up. You also still have the Holy Roman Empire, which at this point is really a loose political conglomerate of nations and duchies in Central Europe. It's really not much of an empire at all anymore. There's also some strong religious ties in the Holy Roman Empire, 
and through marriage it becomes aligned with Spain and it is during this century that you have the rise of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V who's from the Habsburg dynasty and they, that is the most powerful political dynasty well until the end of the 17th century they have a significant international power there's the discovery and exploration of the new world beginning in the late 15th century and so that comes to impact art in Europe so there's this wider geographical expanse and there's a lot of changing political boundaries in this time period, uh, which absolutely impacts art. France and England also become more powerful during this century, mostly because of all the wars that are going on, but also significant issues like trade and various colonial conquests. So I'm showing you this very strange painting that is now referred to as the Garden of Earthly Delights. This is by a Flemish painter named Hieronymus Bosch, and it dates to about 1510 or 1515. So as I said, there's a lot of conflict in the Northern Renaissance. There's a lot of religious persecution. There's economic hardship. And this area that Bosch was working in was actually controlled by a distant king, Philip II, in Spain. So even though it's in Northern Europe, it's controlled by Spain. Despite all of this, strong affluent art centers develop. The Roman Catholic Church continues to commission works of art, but religious controversies led Netherlandish artists to seek private patrons. And this is an example of a work commissioned by a private patron. There are so many interpretations of this work. The overall subject is sin, that is the Christian belief in human beings' natural state of sinfulness and their inability to save themselves from its consequences. This painting is also showing a caution of the self-centered pursuit of pleasures of the flesh. And I'll show you a lot of details of this in just a minute. So again, we have a triptych, and it has religious subject matter like the altar pieces we've seen, but this would have been displayed in a private residence. On the left side, we have the introduction of Adam and Eve. You see God standing on the ground here, Adam seated on the left side, and God is presenting Eve to Adam. In the left side, we also have the strong symbol of an owl, which is a symbol of wisdom and folly. And the owl is in the plant in the lake from which the creatures all creep into the world. So you can see the owl right there in the center. So all of these little creatures are going out into the world. So this is a lot about creation. You see all sorts of different animals, land, sea, and sky creatures. In the center, we have what's generally referred to as the earth scene. You have all sorts of revelers, and I'll show you some details in a few minutes, but you also have these monstrous birds and fruits that are symbolic of fertility and sexual abandon. So there's lots of sin going on here, a lot of strange things that are hard to interpret. You've got these weird constructions in the background that remind me a lot of Dr. Seuss with a sort of parade or ceremony going on around the central lake where all of these animals and people riding the animals are going around in procession. Now on the right side, we have scenes of hell, just like a last judgment scene, which we've seen before. We see a lot of the sensual pleasures like eating, drinking, music, and dancing that are being turned into elements of torture in fire and ice. You've got this weird sensual creature right here. He's got these stumpy legs. He's watching his own stomach. You can see his little face here. He's watching his stomach get filled with all the last souls in a tavern on the way to hell. Very weird scene, very, very weird. So the whole thing, maybe it's supposed to be this parable about human salvation, all of these symbols you see with lust, sex, and orgies, a lot happening here. And it's interesting that it's for a private patron who can contemplate these things, who can see both the parable of it, how you don't want to sin too much, you're going to end up in these terrible tortures. You can also see how there's pleasure involved in seeing all of these new figures, who are doing all sorts of naughty things. So there's a couple of different ways we can read this. If you were to close the two panels, you see this on the exterior. We have the grisaille technique, which is showing the world in this sort of gray orb. And it doesn't correspond exactly to what you see inside, but I like the idea of this closedness. You have the outside world, and then you open it, and you see the interior. So here I'm showing you a few of the details from the central panel. You've got just a lot of really weird stuff going on. Here's the procession I showed you with all of these people riding animals, riding pigs, cows, unicorns, whatever you can see. I, are these people standing on their heads? I don't even know what's happening here. You've got weird sea creatures. Here you've got this fruit-like thing. I don't know what it is. People are crawling in it. This man is leaning over to kiss them. This person has 
is this like a strawberry spiky backpack? What's it doing to his back end? Look out for the rat about to attack you. This lady's sitting here opening up a fruit and eating from it. Here's some more from the central panel. People in weird fruit or plant-like constructions. Why are they carrying this giant fish? Why does she have this flower over her head wearing fruit as hats? And these poor people, I don't know what's going on with their flowers, but there's all sorts of things in here for the viewer to contemplate, to look at this for a long time. You would never get bored looking at this. You would always find something new. So I want to show you a few scenes from the hell area as well. This guy is being bothered by some weird bug knight who's got weird appendages hanging from him. And there's a pig nun, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. This poor guy's gotten sick and he's vomiting into this pit and this person is losing their gold coins in a most unfortunate way. This poor lady is being groped by a tree. Here's even more scenes from hell. And again, I mentioned that these objects of pleasure are being turned into devices of torture. So you've got these musical instruments that are on this guy's being racked on this harp, essentially. I don't know what's happening to this poor guy here. That's a weird demon creature who's beating on a drum and there's a person inside it. Is this a mouse lizard? I have no idea what this is, but it's attacking this poor guy who's also got a knife through his hand. And what is this? I don't know what this is at all. It's like a nun with its flying thing, but it's like a rat pig face. I, I don't know. If you guys have any interpretations, let me know. And here's that central figure I talked about, the stumpy legs and the human face. And here we see the interior of his belly, which is just like a tavern. It's this very confusing exceptionally detailed work that is really hard to interpret. So we've got new sorts of subject matters. These are religious, but absolutely would you never see this object in a church, for example. I'd like to talk now about the Reformation, and I'm showing you here a portrait of a man named Martin Luther, who we credit with starting the Protestant Reformation. This is this religious break from the Roman Catholic Church due to growing unhappiness with what were seen as corrupt practices of the church and the alienation of many lay people. So, for example, Protestants were really unhappy with nepotism, that is the promotion of family members and friends. They were unhappy with indulgences, which were the sales that the Catholic Church would do, the priests and popes would do, which were payment of money to obtain years off of purgatory. And this money went to church building campaigns especially with something like the Project of New St. Peter's. They were also concerned with the role and potential abuse of religious imagery, which we talked about in the fore with iconoclasm. They were worried that images were being idolized, that there was idolatry going on. So there's a lot of, there's actually a state of iconoclasm in the Protestant Reformation as well. It did not occur very suddenly. It took a very long time to develop. There, but there is this movement away from church for religious guidance and practices, especially in the North. You have rosaries, which are personal prayer beads. You have personal books of hours, this emphasis on private devotion. And with the figure of Martin Luther, who I'm showing you here, he is this major catalyst for the official division of the Catholic Church and the Protestants. In 1517, he nailed his 95 theses, or his issues with the Catholic Church, to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral. These were his grievances against the church. He thought there was no need for the church at all. And this was this watershed moment, and a reformation swept Europe, particularly in the north. We see this happening in Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and eventually France and England. Some of the most important tenets of the Protestants are that faith alone is the most important. There was no need for the good works that, the, that Catholicism emphasized. They also emphasized salvation was predetermined and dependent on God's grace, not the intercession of a priest. They also saw that scripture was the most important guide for faith and for Christian doctrine, in particular the Bible, and this is when it becomes translated into the vernacular, that is the language that people actually spoke and read. The Catholics launched a counterattack, which we'll talk about more in the future, which we, we generally call this the counter-reformation. They largely defended their practices among which was the importance of religious images as instructional guides for devotional practices and church doctrines. The Reformation affected virtually every artist after 1520. Before this point, most commissions were religious, as we've seen, 
but in many regions most affected by these reforms, artists were unable to produce religious works regularly. This led to a loss of artistic livelihood. The artistic output in Germany, the Netherlands, and France between the 1520s and the 1570s seriously declined, and a lot of earlier images were destroyed. This occurred in waves throughout Europe. They would sort of rise into a fury and then go into a church and pull down all the sculptures and painting. Some artists continued to do well, including those that we'll discuss today, but for many, this was only because they adapted to the new climate. They, diff they changed their specializations or they moved to a center where they could find work. The first painter I want to talk about is Albrecht Dürer. He is a very famous German painter, and I'm showing you here two self-portraits of Dürer, one from 1498 on the left, and then his more famous one from 1500, where he is a very Christ-like figure. He was not only a painter, but also a graphic artist and a theorist, and he was from Nuremberg, Germany. He was the first German artist to achieve international fame and recognition. He was also the first one to be significantly influenced by Italian Renaissance developments and incorporated Renaissance humanist ideals and design principles into his work. So in his style, we see a dualism between the Northern styles and the Italian. He traveled extensively over the course of his career all over Europe, including two visits to Italy. He actually stayed in Venice for quite some time. He met and worked with the foremost artists of the time, also intellectuals, humanists, and, and acquired patrons in this way, including Erasmus of Rotterdam, who was a famous Protestant writer. Durer appreciated the teachings and writings of Luther, and certain works of art do show an interest in certain teachings and ideologies promoted by Luther. So the first image by Durer I want to talk about is this painting referred to as the Four Apostles. Durer painted this because he wanted to show that there could be a Protestant religious art. It has an explicitly Protestant message. It was to be hung in the city hall in Nuremberg rather than in a church. Now, the, the figures we're seeing here are not technically the four apostles, as the painting is often called, the four holy men. Now, the positioning of the figures have, carries a lot of meaning here. Notice that Peter, who, remember, is a very important symbol for the Catholic Church, He's situated behind John the Evangelist, because remember, P Peter is important to the papacy, and here he's being shown as lesser, smaller in the background than John, who is considered an important evangelist for Martin Luther. And it looks like John is instructing Peter out of this book. You know it's Peter because of his keys. There's an emphasis in both sides of this reading from the Bible, the Word of God, which was seen as an individual and private aspect in Protestantism. This idea of the Word of God, the importance of it, is reiterated by the inscription that you see on the bottom, which comes from John the Evangelist. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the opening line of John's Gospel book. Not only do you have this inscription from John's Gospel, but you have one from each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all come from Luther's translation of the book into the vernacular. And they mostly deal with this idea of the Word of God, but also about preaching of false prophets. On the right side, we have Paul in the front and St. Mark in the back, Mark the Evangelist. Paul was also very important for Luther. He was considered the apostle of the Protestant Reformation. He wrote a good portion of the New Testament, so that is another way he's emphasizing the Word, because Paul is a significant Christian writer. So it's interesting how Durer is trying to find a way to make Protestant religious art. Unfortunately, this does not get destroyed, probably because it wasn't in a church, so it wasn't considered to be venerated in any way. I also want to talk about Durer as a, a printmaker. That is, he produced a lot of prints, which, remember, the rise of the printing press also leads to the rise of printed images, artistic images, that is. This is called Melancholia I because he produced more than one image of this idea of melancholy. And this comes from 1514, and the technique is called engraving. So as we saw with his self-portraits, Durer is interested in examining the artist, the idea of the artist, and also himself. Melancholia is a sort of representation of him, even though the figure representing Melancholia is a woman, it still kind of has a resemblance of him. And also, an engraving means that the hand of the artist is very present because you can see this careful drawing that goes into the production of the print. So this is a copper engraving, and the way engravings are made is that a 
A copper plate is incised with a sharp metal tool called a burin. Then the plate is covered in ink and then wiped clean so that the ink remains in the grooves. Then an impression is made on damp paper through a printing press so that the pressure from the press transfers the ink in the grooves to the paper. What this means is that you could have multiple versions. So for example, this image I'm showing you here exists in many different copies, the exact same image which is produced over and over and over again. Now engraving is particularly good for subtle modeling and shading. So you have lots of dark shadows here and it's done in a, a more naturalistic way than some of the other printmaking techniques. The fact that prints can be mass produced means that prints could be available at a lower cost so more people could own these and also that they would have a higher circulation. So prints were a really good way to spread a certain message and actually the Protestant Reformation uses printmaking as a very common tool to promote their ideas, although I'm not showing you a religious print here. So we see melancholy represented as an artist, with the, but she's also an idea because she's got these big wings, so she's a personification of melancholy. It's an artist with a melancholy expression. It's a sort of winged genius who seems to be Durer himself. One reason that is is because just below the figure you have the monogram of Durer that always shows up, this big A with a D inscribed in it. He includes that in most of his paintings and also his prints. So for example, we also see it here in this self-portrait with the date and in the self-portrait here under the inscription. The pose that melancholy is in is very conventional and it derives from antiquity. So a, a viewer would know who this was if they were familiar with antique types. You can also see it identified here in this little banner, this little bat is used, is holding, flying through the sky. Melancholy is looking for inspiration to the point that she's overthinking, so she can't even act. She's got instruments all around. She's got the stone she could carve in. She's got this compass she could design from. All of these tools surround her, but she can't come up with anything to do. There's details within that refer to the passage of time, especially the hourglass, which we see up above. The bat here doesn't just support the banner, it also has a symbolic function because it's associated with the nighttime, and so that leads it to be associated with melancholy as well. So it's an interesting print that's got a lot of symbolic meaning. The viewer might read all, might understand all of this just fine, but really it's got a lot to say about the artist, and this was something that Durer was quite occupied with. So Durer was this very prolific artist. He was, he traveled extensively, he saw a lot of art, he met a lot of artists when he was in Italy, and he transmits a lot of these ideas to Germany. But he's also significantly impacted by the Protestant Reformation, and he's one of these people who adapts his work. You can see his work in lots and lots of museums, in lots of media, very important artist to be familiar with. Now, for the last monument today, I want to talk about this German painter named Hans Holbein the Younger. And I'm showing you here his most famous portrait of Henry VIII, which dates to about 1540. And here we have an example of oil on panel. Holbein was a German painter who is slightly younger than Durer and his generation. And his career was largely based in Basel in Switzerland and in England, which is why we see him painting Henry VIII. He's most noted for his court portraits. He doesn't just paint Henry. In fact, he paints almost every significant member of his court, including several of his queens, several of his potential wives, several of his advisors, ambassadors to the court. So he was a, a very prolific court artist and succeeded very well in England. His style is a combination of objective realism that is traditional of Northern Renaissance art, so an emphasis on surface detail, but also incorporates this monumentality that we often associate with Italian Renaissance art. He is exposed to Italian Renaissance influences through humanist circles, so he was also in contact with Erasmus of Rotterdam, and it's thought that Erasmus is the one who actually helped him get into the French court. He also did a stint in France where he came into contact with works by Leonardo da Vinci, among other people. Leonardo da Vinci dies in France, so that's why some of his works are there. As I mentioned, the early part of his career was in Basel in Switzerland. But he had to leave it on account of iconoclasm and the Reformation. He's one of those artists who was forced to move because work dried up where he lived. There was no opportunity to continue painting. He went to England to try to become a court painter for the Tudor court of Henry VIII and, and succeeded very well, although we don't quite know how he managed to do that. 
just like with other rulers we've talked about, Henry VIII's image becomes very standardized, and Holbein is a big promoter of that. So in this image, we see the king and only the king. He is set against this dark background. There's no setting really to worry about. We do have this inscription indicating how old Henry was in this painting. Notice how much space the king occupies, his enormous body. Remember, he's quite a large man in general. All of his portraits show him as such. His body is occupying almost the entire panel. His shoulders go almost all the way across. There's this emphasis on the frontality of the portrait. He's looking straight out at us. Now, there's probably been a little bit of idealization going on here, showing him as this very large dominant figure rather than the fat, sick man that he was. He suffered from a lot of maladies. We see this stern expression. The raised eyebrows give this life to his face. But Holbein emphasizes his enormous wealth. So his enormous person, but also his enormous wealth. He's got this splendid costume on. He's got very fashionable clothing. So you've got this undershirt, this linen undershirt that's been pulled through all of the little eyelets in this huge brocaded red overgarment. So somebody spent all this time going through all of these holes and pulling out the linen shirt. Then he has this huge gold and fur lined cloak. On top of that, we've got this jeweled necklace of sorts that goes from shoulder to shoulder. Even his hat ha is covered in jewels. And the whole thing just conveys the splendor of Henry and his court. He's holding his gloves in his hand. He's got his powerful stance of his hand on his hip. His both hands wear rings. We have jewels lining his chest and on each sleeve. So you can see the sumptuousness of the clothing. And that is really what Holbein spends a lot of his time on. A lot of the detail is in this fabric because he's very much a part of this Northern European tradition of showing surface texture. The clothing looks real, almost more real than the face itself. Although notice the, the nice shadows, the sort of cl cleft in the cheek here that we have, the carefully rendered facial hair. So he's very interested in, in representing details and surfaces and conveying a sense of naturalism. Really, his major thing he wants to convey, though, is the power of the king. Henry VIII is very easy to identify in portraits because he is almost always shown like this, in sumptuous clothing, hand on hip, and in full body portraits with his legs in a wide stance. So he's this very powerful, immovable figure. And just to wrap up for the day, what we talked about today was less of an emphasis on classicism in the North than what we saw in Italy. We also talked about this rise of oil as a medium. Hopefully looking at these objects today, you can tell they have more luminosity and more layering and color availability than tempera or fresco for that matter. We also talked quite a bit about the Protestant Reformation and the effects that it had on art. And they were many and different. So we see artists traveling to new places to work. We see new subject matters. Uh, we also saw a bit of a rise of an interest in the artist himself with the self-portraits of Jan van Eyck and Durer. Now to finish module nine, you'll need to complete the self-assessment. This is a required part of completing the module and it is part of your participation grade. There's also a journal entry that you will find the prompt for on Blackboard. The vocabulary wiki, this is for you group three. Please take care of this, organize within yourself who's gonna cover what material. Also, do not forget that the second part of your paper is due on Sunday in addition to your weekly quiz. You've got a couple of assignments to cover the weekend. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you again for Module 10 when we talk about the High Renaissance in Italy. Thank you.